The delusion of Terps being both a hate group and an actual threat to trans individuals has coalesced into the acceptance of the term as a legitimate moniker. TERF, standing for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist, stems from a criticism of a lesbian land festival remaining female only. Truly, what it critiques is an unwillingness to forget that biological sex is real and unchangeable, and that one sex has oppressed the other for millennia on end as a result of reproductive ability. The term is useful for shutting down conversations, as trans people are often presented as the underdogs of the oppressed, and therefore as the reigning voices in liberal circles which prize victimization as currency. To question those deemed of the oppressed group is to be bigoted, regardless of how kind, logical, or rational those criticisms are. As a result, authors such as Gretchen Felker Martin have taken advantage of the desire to validate trans people over all else, as well as the liberal turf boogeyman to write his take on a world without men. The dystopian manless world trope, commonly resulting from a plague or other cataclysmic event, is typically used to explore what life would be like if half of the population was removed. These stories do not forget men. Nay, they center around them as their absence drives the novel. However, Felker Martin claims that novels like The Power or Why the Last Man are not inclusive enough, and leaves out the experiences of trans individuals. Although he admits that his novel could not exist without the works of early feminists which explored the idea of women-centric societies, such as Herland, he doesn't find any of them to be particularly good because, and I quote, I think that almost every gender side story breaks down along chromosomal or hormonal or some sort of nebulous gender lines in a way that reality doesn't. What's a man? How do you define a man by behavior or biology? And you're always going to hit a stumbling block when you try to include everyone who you think of as a man, if you saw them, and exclude others whom you wouldn't. Manhunt tries to get granular about this, and you can't account for everything as a single author, but I've done a lot of reading, and I gave that my best shot. It's very strange to me that a genre that is all about examining what a gender role is and how gender roles might behave in different sorts of vacuums or absence doesn't have a very firm grip on things like what's a woman, what's a man and I think that's because they don't have any interest in the internal sense of those things. In other words, he thinks those stories are bad because they treat biological sex as being the determiner of what makes a person a man or a woman, rather than relying on a nebulous, inclusive definition that in turn is deeply regressive and fails to accurately define man or woman at all. Why the Last Man is a flawed story, as all are in some way, but it cannot be argued that it doesn't address trans individuals. A trans man survives the death of all men, and trans women do not. This is because, regardless of identification, their biological sex remains unchanged. Because the publishing run was between 2002 and 2008, the series has largely been shielded from accusations of transphobia, though it did not escape criticism completely as a Screen Rant article wrote about claiming a problematic treatment of trans men and an unintentional implication that gender identity is a matter of choice. If Brian Vaughn were to write this today, he might have changed his story to cater to the idea of gender identity being more important than biological sex. But as it remains written, he didn't. Felker Martin's work does. I belatedly realized that I did not actually give a summary of the book until the very end of this video, so I am putting in what was originally at the end of the video to this forward point. So that's why the footage is different, that's why the quality is different, etc. Hopefully this isn't too jarring, I apologize in advance. Well, this book was basically Beth and Fran hunt a man for his balls because that's what they use to make estrogen. They run into the turfs who Beth tries to kill one of them despite them not seeing each other, could have just waited, whatever. They end up going on the run. While they're on the run, um, the trans man Robbie is basically fleshing out and killing men and creatures. They end up storming the house that Beth and Fran are in. They rape <laughs> one of the characters. And then when they get back to their friend Indy's house, who is the PCOS Indian doctor, she's been given a job offer with one of the bunker brats who has like luxury still, who wants her to give her a baby using one of the man creatures, which parthenogenesis is a realistic, like you, you could just make female only babies. You didn't have to do it that way. Like even like her land, which is super old, was able to, figure out like yeah women could just continue the race without men but whatever um they end up having they end up living there in the compound for an unspecified amount of time because it just wasn't very clear wherein eventually they are sold out to the turfs for labor they go on the run etc they have some periods where they're trying to sabotage the turfs the turfs want to create a naval army to clear out all the trans women 
which again is so, in, it, there wouldn't be that many. The proportion of trans women and the ones who wouldn't have transformed would be like minuscule. Women make up 50% of the population. So you'd have like one in like a thousand, if not, <laughs> if not even less being trans women. So the sheer number of them in the story just doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, then they run off to a, a, a supposed like lesbian commune, dyke land or something, which gets overrun because they run trucks into the wall that they're standing on, which lets the men in. The men swarm the area. Um, Beth dies. Indy and Fran get together, and Ramona, the turf chaser, who cheated and turned like she she sabotaged her end of things gets told you're such an awful person the end he lumps together trans men and women with hormonal disorders as being the same as men as in his book the plague delineated between the testosterone rich and testosterone poor rather than merely male or female never mind that men have much higher levels of testosterone than women do and therefore the division of who survives and who doesn't would necessarily be gendered regardless of identification the pitting of women with hormonal disorders as well as trans men as enemies of so-called TERFs illustrates a misunderstanding both of what radical feminists believe as well as how those hormonal issues work. Women with hormonal issues, without breasts, with intersex developmental disorders or hysterectomies. All of them are still women and their experiences are female experiences. Just as we would not use an example of a person born of six fingers as justification to say that humans have six fingers, women can have developments both inborn and as the result of illness or injury that can create differences from them and the average woman. Regardless, women are female or of the sex that creates ova, a fact that can be seen in every cell of their bodies no matter what afflictions may prevent them from doing so. Although arbitrarily lumped in with trans women and trans men, women with hormonal disorders like PCOS do not have testosterone levels similar to that of men. Unlike what is implied in the text when a TERF notes that they have the medication to keep their kids and PCOS patients from going feral. As found in Clark et al.'s 2018 study, the range of testosterone levels in females of PCOS extends beyond that of the normal female range, but not into the normal male range, the lower limit of which averaged 8.8 nmol per liter per month about two-fold higher than that of the upper end of the range for PCOS, which is 5.5 nmol per liter. Trans men have had higher testosterone than natal males as a result of their hormone usage, and so might be included in the figures depicted as mindless beasts within his tail, but that too depends as a large number of trans people never take hormones at all. As such, trans women will be more likely to turn into one of the testosterone-laden beasts because their bodies naturally make testosterone a fact which seems to have been forgotten given that the trans women in the story somehow receive estrogen synthesized from the testicles of transformed men. While it is true that men and women both have testosterone and estrogen, and that the division of the two hormones into woman hormones and man hormones is a bit reductive, the differences in levels based on sex are drastic and impact health if not in healthy ranges. Premenopausal women typically have estradiol levels which fall between 30 to 400 pg per milliliter, which falls to 0 to 30 pg per milliliter for postmenopausal women. The common range for men is 10 to 50 pg per milliliter. Lower levels of testosterone in men as they age and lowered levels of estradiol in women after menopause is normal. However, hormonal imbalances prior to aging lead to side effects. For men, high estradiol levels lead to infertility gynecomastia, or the development of breasts, erectile dysfunction, slowed growth, exhaustion, loss of muscle mass and bone density, and concentration issues. These side effects are never addressed in the text or even hinted at. In fact, they're actively subverted with the myriad of sex scenes which occur, all of which with trans characters. Despite the danger men pose from both regular and sexual violence within the story, the preoccupation of the book is with TERFs. TERFs are presented as a militant group of homogeneous white women, the class of which is continually denigrated throughout the novel despite the protagonists, Beth and Fran, presumably wanting to transition to or be viewed as one. There are many instances of noting that women are white, with quite some derision. These passages include, but are not limited to, one last look showed her most of the TERFs struggling to reload, and one, a stocky, fierce-looking white girl with a septum piercing, jogging out ahead of the others, crossbow held low across her body at an angle, waiting for a shot that would count. 
There had always been rad femmes in New England, enclaves of snarling middle-class white women who talked a lot about performing gender roles and appropriating lived experience. They curated incestuous little social media cells where they repeated the same six talking points to the same 30 other white women, while cis men came sniffing around their hindquarters, venting pent-up hatred on trans women and making sure real women saw them doing it so they could get accredited as feminist, and maybe, they were lucky, catch a whiff of... And I'd just like to note that I find the trend of noting white women specifically as being enemies of trans women, as well as the derision towards actual feminist concerns to be very illustrative of the author's opinions on feminism and privilege. But more on that later on. On the steps of the quaint white hall with its table and its sharp pitched roof was a stern looking white woman in a worn police uniform, mid 40s or older, and beside her, smoking a menthol and looking pissy, was a teenage girl wearing fatigues over an XX t-shirt, a rifle slung across her back. She says there may be a lot of them, but they're the same stupid white women who thought pussy hats could overthrow the government. And I'd like to note that that was not their purpose, and that the creator of those hats was an Asian woman. There are plenty more examples of this, but we will be here all day if I read every single one. The depiction of only white women as being able to identify sex or being the only ones concerned with the outcome of not doing so is patronizing and racist. A black turf is identified early on as being a sympathizer who does not view trans women as threats, unlike her compatriots. In turn, she is later outed and killed. Indy, who is an Indian woman with PCOS and describes having a round face with thick black hair shot through prematurely with gray, who was the fattest woman Fran had ever known, her upper arms like pillows, her belly hanging halfway to her dimpled knees, and two thick soft rolls clearly visible through her faded Cannibal Corpse t-shirt. I just find it very interesting how everybody who's on the side of the trans woman is in a minority group, and everyone who is against trans women is white. The underlying racism within this book, wherein all black and brown women are sympathizers or misled, and are presented as unintelligent enough to mistake men for women, or at least willing to ignore the danger of having a male in their midst, is reminiscent of general gender ideology lines, wherein black women and other women of color are constantly compared to trans women, because obviously, being black is the same thing as being a man. Racist struggle and misogynoir is used to make the argument that trans women are women, and yet ignores both the importance of race and sex on the treatment of an oppressed class. Those who acknowledge the roles that sex has on danger levels are painted as bigots and extremists. Meanwhile, the only black woman in the turf army is painted as misguided and peer pressured, despite the majority of the world's feminists being radical feminists by necessity, thus painting women of color as willfully ignorant or unintelligent in order to support Fulker Martin's belief that all radical feminists are somehow white supremacists. This isn't particularly surprising, as Felker Martin answered in an interview, that sort of utopian feminism and political lesbianism and other aspects of the second wave of feminism, which would sort of morph and mutate into a modern landscape of turfdom, which of course now is a sort of blanket term from everything from rabid vaccine-denying bizarre parents of trans children that they hate and are afraid of, to actual radical feminists who are whipping up violence against trans people, and use this as a wedge issue. That's the world they want. They want to replace men, and if you do that without examining anything underneath it, if you do that without taking white supremacy above the roots, then you get more white supremacy. Sure, women who want to live without men, who recognize that sex-based oppression is real, are the same thing as white supremacists. Feminism is obviously only for white women, and the works of black authors like Bell Hooks, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Chimanda Ngozi are secretly white, or maybe they're just, dis just misinformed, as gender activists love to paint feminists of color who disagree with them as just being naive and just not knowing any better. This lack of understanding of feminist rhetoric is a continuing thread throughout the novel, which is full of excessive sex scenes and sexualizes the rape of one of its trans characters. While rape is not necessarily a topic to shy away from, clumsy writing eroticizes an experience which is deeply gendered with men committing 98% of rapes and 88% of those victims being women. The author himself has noted that he never writes anything without at least one rape scene. These include lines on his Twitter such as, I mean, what's uniquely horrible about rape? Why is it so much less acceptable to portray than, say, murder or war? And there should be more rape and horror. And the scene in question is, and trigger warning here, Claude Fingers slid through her hair and pressed down, forcing her face into the wet earth. Her arm and the knife was trapped beneath her body. She thought that if she could just find a way to keep the mantis in her field of vision, she might slip out of herself. Associated completely from the hard cock, barbed like a cat, scratching at her inner thighs, from the clawed hands tearing at the seat of her shorts, and the frantic, stupid flash of embarrassment that she hadn't shaved her legs in months. But she couldn't see it. You'll notice the sexualization of the scene itself. The inclusion of, I haven't shaved my legs, which is just... 
okay. And this continues when Beth has a sexual fantasy in the aftermath of this scene. Compare this to the testimony of a female rape victim, as is noted in Dorkin's Our Blood. Rape is not an academic question with the present writer, for not long ago, she, then in her late 50s, joined the growing army of rape victims. It was a case of forcing a window and entering, forcible assault with the huge bruising hands of the rapist tied around her neck, and was accompanied by burglary. All these circumstances convinced the police immediately that a crime had been committed. It helps to be elderly and no longer sexually attractive, too. It was two or three days before the shock wore off and the full impact of the experience hit her. She became very ill, and now, nearly three years later, she has not recovered. The police told her she was lucky not to have been murdered. But that remains an unanswered question in her mind. Simple murder would not have involved the horror, the insulting violation of personhood, the degradation, the devastating affront to the dignity, and the sensation of bodily filth that time has not washed off. Nor would it have led to years of startled awakenings from sound sleep, the cold sweats and noises in the dark, the palpitations of the heart at the sound of a deep male voice, the horribly repeated image of two large muscular hands approaching her throat, the rumbling voice that promised to kill her if she struggled or tried to scream, the unbearable vision of being found on the floor of her own home, lying half-naked and dead with her legs ridiculously spread. In addition, Dworkin quote of note is, a woman's erotic femininity is measured by the degree to which she needs to be hurt, needs to be possessed, needs to be abused, needs to submit, needs to be beaten, needs to be humiliated, needs to be degraded. Any woman who resists acting out these so-called needs, or any woman who rebels against the values inherent in these needs, or any woman who refuses to sanction or participate in her own destruction, is characterized as a deviant, one who denies her femininity, a shrew, a bitch, etc. Typically, such deviants are brought back into the female flock by rape, gang rape, or some form of bondage. The theory is that once such women have tasted the intoxicating sweetness of the submission, they will, like lemmings, rush to their own destruction. Felger Martin seems to understand this well enough through the rape of his trans woman character rather than that of a female. Feminization is evident in many stereotypes of those characters from wishing to have shaved before getting assaulted, to the depiction of trans women in the text as being interchangeable with trans girls. What I find interesting is how there is a very large number of trans women, despite the majority of those who identify as trans not being on hormones. Men who might choose estrogen or castration to avoid being turned into creatures is not explored. Trans women can and will turn, if not provided with estrogen, which is established as not easy to access. The few pupubescent boys are described as being set on a future of castration. The turf armies which roam the land do hunt and kill trans women, but given that trans women are akin to bitten zombie victims in the story, the betrayal of a pragmatic action as bigoted or evil is just stupid to me. The risk of danger is very high, and yet it's often downplayed of trans characters who are often described as trans girls and given very feminine gestures and descriptions. For example, in the first chapter, Beth admits that the risk of transformation is high as, if I ever run out of Spyro and E, I'll be one of them a few weeks later, and then some other T girl is going to put an arrow through my skull and slice off my balls. Oh well, so sad. Fran also notes that transformation can occur even after castration. After T-Day, it got worse. Fran could still picture the viral video of the trans girl succumbing to the virus while under observation at St. Vincent after bottom surgery. Her skin splitting along her shoulder blades and the camera is shaking frame. Bloody foam dripping from her chin as she lurched through a privacy curtain and someone out of sight started to scream. She could still hear the pickup fuzz whisper of spotless green linen against antiseptic tile. The men in the story play more of a background role than anything, and despite being described numerous times as a threat to female survivors, not merely as zombie-like rabbit creatures which will devour a woman, but also for the sexual danger they pose, the pragmatic solution of not including or sheltering those who are male and at risk of transforming is viewed as an extreme. If a man rapes a woman and the resulting embryo is male, it claws its way out of the woman. It eats its way out. Most resulting children from these are male. Several passages illustrate these points, including, but not limited to, They had trouble with swallowing. These things the plague had made out of anyone with enough testosterone in their system to put out a decent crop of back hair. Mostly, they ripped their prey apart and gulped the meat down in chunks, or dug up grubs and beetles and whatever roots they could get their gnarled claws on. They'd eat pretty much anything if it came down to it. Fran had seen one choke on a tennis ball. The plague, T-Rex, was as reliable as the atomic effing clock. First, relentless hunger pangs, mood swings, fever. Dermal fissures that wet pus and cloudy blood before scabbing over, bursting and scabbing again until the skin was nearly an inch thick in places. Delirium, intense spikes of aggression. Once the initial lava flow of symptoms cooled and hardened into the shrieking ravenous things that seethed like lice over the entire American supercontinent, 
Something clicked on inside whatever remained of the man's brain, and he started looking for something to rape, maim, and leave half dead like those wasps that laid their eggs in living tarantulas. The good news was that pregnancy was shorter now, much shorter. The bad news was that the babies ate their way out. Or, from the opening chapter, a scream rose up from the woods. It hung in the air, high and quavering, and seemed to come from all sides. Another voice, farther away, added its ear-piercing song in a white knife of terror cut through Fran's paralysis. She knew that sound. It had chased her for five years, chased her all the way from the dressing room at the Charlotte Roost at the Steeplegate Mall to this overgrown ditch where she knelt quivering, sweat streaming down her face, waiting to die. She looked up. They came on all fours, some still screaming, others making a kind of low, rhythmic grunting deep in their chest. It sounded like the tigers Fran remembered from York's Wild Kingdom. The portrayal of Terps within the story illustrates not only a misunderstanding of what radical feminists believe, but a hypersexualization of these so-called enemies. This is despite the inciting incident at the start of the book being Fran and Beth's unwarranted aggression towards the leader of the Terps, who Fran sexually fantasizes about. Again, this is sexualized aggression, evident in the reaction to a person wanted, who wants them dead, which is such a male reaction. The whole text is hypersexualized with an excessive number of sex scenes, and I mean there are 15. There are 15 of these, many of them like right after the other. The depiction of sworn enemies, an entire class of them, being sexual objects reeks to me of male sexuality, wherein degradation and humiliation, sexual service to whatever degree, are necessary components of masculinity, which the trans women in this novel attempt to disavow everywhere except for their sexuality. As Dworkin wrote, in pornography, sadism is the means by which men establish their dominance. Sadism is the authentic exercise of power which confirms manhood, and the first characteristic of manhood is that its existence is based on the negation of the female. Manhood can only be certified by abject female degradation, a degradation never abject enough until the victim's body and will have both been destroyed. In other words, a man establishes dominance, he must also publicly establish ownership. Ownership is proven when a man can humiliate a woman in front of and for the pleasure of his fellows and still she remains loyal to him. Alongside this strange sexualization of women are, who are claimed to be the swarm enemies of trans women is an erroneous and surface level depiction of radical feminism. Common mantras and adages which discuss biological sex are made fun of despite their honesty and presented as illogical or bigoted, even though this apocalypse is depicted as being based on testosterone levels, and those levels are sexually divided. Naturally, trans women pre-castration will be at risk of changing. The Terps are primarily described as having short cropped hair, undercuts, and masculine appearances. They share tattoos of XX on their foreheads that mark their true women, and are obviously meant to draw comparisons to Nazis. They were a hundred yards off, half hidden by the thinning pines near the forest edge. A dozen women, most of them in their late teens or early twenties, a few younger, all in fatigue, most sporting undercuts, stood clustered around the bikes where Fran and Beth had left them leaning up against the rusted metal rack, a holdover from when this place had been shot through with hiking trails for rich yuppies from Boston who wanted somewhere serene to surround themselves with nature and stargaze and do cayenne and lemon juice cleanses and blow. F. Beth groaned, rocking back up onto her haunches and settling into a loose, ready crouch. It's the effing chromosome crusaders. Suddenly, the group of girls fell silent. They parted as smoothly as a set of drapes, and a thin, pale woman of unremarkable height, maybe 40 years old, strode through the divided group towards the bikes. She wore crisp fatigues and a short, tight leather jacket zipped up to her collarbones. On her forehead, dead center above the bridge of her pert little ski slope nose, was a stark tattoo. XX. Certified all natural with the daughters of the witches you couldn't burn, or whatever Michigan Women's Music Festival, uh, bees, the Trevophocy, and Maryland bowed down to. F. We can wait them out, Fran whispered, chin practically kissing the dirt, hair stuck to her neck of flop sweat. Worst case is they take our bikes and we walk home. We have enough meds to get us there, I think. It should be fine. It's probably going to be fine. Hey, maybe get down a little more? Oh, mother F me, whispered Beth, not even pretending to listen. That's queen turf. That's effing teach. Fran's eyes widened and she stared at the long, thin-haired woman currently sorting through the contents of Beth's bike basket. They called her Teach She'd Heard because she'd been a psychological consultant at Guantanamo Bay before T-Day hit. She was a medical doctor too, according to the rumors at the Fort Fisher trading post up near Seabrook when they'd gone to find a buyer for their excess E. Whatever her deal and whatever she'd come from, there was no doubting she was hardcore. She got their hands on them and they were effed. Dead. Done. The tattooed woman said something that made her retinue laugh. Fran watched her lips move, watched the play of muscles under her smooth face as she smiled. 
a cold thrill went up her spine. God, you don't need to have a wet dream about an effing gender essentialist neo-fascist. She squeezed her eyes shut, nipping in the bud her imagination's little spurt of latex tight against pale skin and thighs divided into lickable quarters by garter's edge and delicate black lace. Of a hand in the back of her neck squeezing tighter and tighter until. She bit her lip, cutting through the haze, and the world swam back into normalcy. Well, except that Beth was standing up and she had her bow in one hand, an arrow in the other. This is the first description of the TERFs, which are presented as both militant, but as a subject of sexual desire. Which is interesting to me because for the most part this book likes to subvert that, it likes to pretend, it likes to pretend, basically, that TERFs are sexually attracted to trans women and that's why radical feminists have criticisms of them. Which is honestly projection, because radical feminists, a lot of us are lesbian or bisexual, but most of us are simply just not happy with the fact that biological men are taking over places for women, such as having scholarships given to men in a world where we've had literally generations, millennia, of sex exclusivity in academia, in sports or whatnot. Only for the past hundred years or so, less than that really, have we been able to make any gains, and yet here they are pushing us back. So no, women do not typically want to have sex with the people they dislike. That's a male thing. And of course, this whole text likes to present it otherwise, as there is a whole subplot with a turf army woman being in a relationship with a trans woman. The idea of chasers, which I'll get into later, but I just, this whole thing just reads as badly written erotica. Anyhow, even with turfs being depicted as masculine, with close shaved heads and army attire, butches and trans men are placed in the same category as trans women. This is despite trans men obviously not having access to hormones and therefore being unlikely to pass as male. Trans men are female and included in radical feminism. Butches are female and included in radical feminism. Regardless of gender identity, regardless of the clothes they wear, all females are a part of feminism. Despite noting that this is a sex-specific virus, the author continually misrepresents radical feminism as being both racist and homophobic, regardless of the fact that many of us are same-sex attracted and not white. The conflicting descriptions of TERFs are consistent at least, either being middle-class feminine white women or predatory dykes, just as gender activists cannot seem to determine what radical feminists believe, despite only needing to crack open a book to do so. Meanwhile, trans women are typically described as sexually attractive, well-passing, and as feminine. For example, when Robbie, the trans man, comes across the two trans women from this book, he notes trans, but he could only tell by the very slight swelling of her Adam's apple. With her long, straight nose and narrow jaw, a mendable shave maybe, she looked sad and wayfish, hunched, elbows drawn in. A sudden pang of homesickness closed his throat and brought tears to his eyes. Of course, this is five years into the apocalypse, and presumably all makeup and beautifying measures have been left behind. And I somehow doubt that any trans woman truly passes in this type of situation, besides those who use gender blockers to avoid puberty and then completely skip to feminizing stuff. Anyhow, many scenes present feminist rhetoric as bigoted or extremist, which I read this whole book in like one day, guys. I did it for you. For example, in the what purposeful misquoting of Janice Rand's transsexual empire, which is quoted as, I contend that the problem of transsexualism will be best served by morally mandating it out of existence. The actual quote is, as corrected on her website, the issue of transsexualism has profound political and moral ramifications. Transsexualism itself is a deeply moral question rather than a medical technical answer. I contend that the problem of transsexualism will best be served by morally mandating it out of existence. Which means that I want to eliminate the medical and social systems that support transsexualism and the reasons why in a gender-defined society, persons find it necessary to change their bodies. Nowhere do I say, as Johnson attributes to me, transsexuals should be eradicated on moral grounds. Jansen's quote, and the words of those who echo this falsehood, has overtones of ethnic cleansing and make it sound like I want to eliminate transgendered persons from the face of the earth. This quote is placed alongside one from Louise Berry, which reads, As a transsexual, I don't think of myself as a woman. Women are human females. I'm a human male who went through medical procedures to alleviate dysphoria, none of which has rendered me a woman. Sex and genetics are immutable. This quote is similarly honest and illustrates a trend of denying material reality and the immutability of sex. A clear theme throughout this novel which attempts to position trans women as being meaningfully different from regular men, and yet must admit based on the rules of its own making that the only differences are made via self-injection of hormones rather than anything innate. 
Another quote which really got me was a speech given by Teach, the head turf, to Ramona, and it's painted as being akin to grooming. It reads, Do you know why we're taught to hate old women? Because they're of no more use to men. Can't cook, can't fuck, can't breed, no use at all. But they remember. They remember the rapes, the beatings, the cracked skulls, and the little arms yanked out of sockets. They remember and men know it, and if you can't rip a woman, if you can't kill her, slap her, shout over her every word, then you have to face her, and you have to face the things you've done. But where is the lie? Men have class consciousness despite their age, while women are taught that older women are not warning younger women, but are just jealous of and in competition with them. This is a legitimate thing, a legitimate topic of discussion within the, the feminist community for a reason. There's also a really weird preoccupation with periods. While giving a speech to prepubescent boys, Teach slips a hand inside of her coat and drew out a crusty, half-wet tampon by its string, and Robbie has a period start while having sex with Beth. I find the TERFs in this novel to be a more sympathetic group than the trans women, who are all presented as victims and homogeneous in their injustice. Again, this is a society wherein men are zombie-like creatures that will painfully eat and rape you, and yet the TERFs literally offer surgery and hormones to young boys and trans women who agree to labor for the exchange. One such individual is even given a high role in their army, and yet they are still presented as extremists and bigots. One of the selling points of this is a romance between a chaser in the TERF army, Ramona, and a trans woman. Ramona and her trans partners are supposed to be presented as star-crossed lovers, with Ramona's masochistic tendencies being, well, statistic tendencies being presented as similar to sexuality. It also ignores that most chasers are male, and ignores the possibility of her merely wanting male partners. Ramona fantasizes about having sex with a man, only sleeps with women who are pre-op, and yet argues that she has never slept with men. She was on her feet now, advancing on the bed. I've never been with an effing man. Oh no, Feather's voice dripped cold contempt. They didn't flinch as she loomed over them. You've never had a cock inside you? You're a woman. Sid's pink hair in her fist, Marina's thighs parting for her mouth, revealing the tender thing taped back between them. I love women. Editing note from me in the future. Um, I just wanted to note that this section, along with the general perception of Teach being a like, grooming Ramona into believing this way, it gives off the impression that um, Felker Martin thinks that trans exclusionary radical feminists are grooming young heterosexual women into believing that they're lesbians through, I guess, political lesbianism or something. It's a very weird take. Like, you're, instead of just recognizing that, like, a lot of us just don't like men, and then the ones that do are picky because they realize that they can be picky. And no, no, the takeaway from that isn't that, hey, maybe we should change how, you know, dating works for women who are into men. It's no, it's all the women who would be dating me as a trans woman are being groomed into not doing so. It's a very weird take, but I wanted to point out that I did note that. One thing this novel does do accurately is capture the average trans and queer space experience, although I am unsure how the author thought that it would be sympathetic. One great example is of a queer housing space asking the pre-op trans woman to leave because they are afraid of the potential turning, because obviously asking for same-sex housing is, is bigoted and hypocritical and not a matter of safety in a world where men turn into rape zombies. But many of these examples include when she did sleep, she dreamed of the world that was gone, of her last few shifts at the Park Avenue Starbucks and the sputtering progress of her FFS fundraiser on Twitter. She dreamed of refreshing the page again and again, only to find donations draining away, supportive comments deleted. She dreamed of the slender, elegant face she designed with her surgeon, Dr. Bakshi. Or Robbie, the trans man character. His cramps were coming back and he really needed a new pad. For a moment he felt a twinge of dysphoria, a sense that someone might have heard his thoughts and sneered at them. It passed. He smiled to himself and the room went dark. It felt like half remembering a funny dream to think back on how insecure he'd been, how he'd pissed and moaned at Tess over every picture she took of him, too feminine, and every time he, she put her arm around his waist. Emphasizing that I'm smaller than you is effing transphobic. That venal, frightened voice inside of him had shriveled up and died five years ago while he sat drugged in an adjustable hospital bed, chest numb and eyes blurry, watching the world burn on TV and trying not to cry because of the doctors on the news were right, he'd never be able to take tea again and his entire family was going to die. Because evidently, not being able to take hormones is of equal importance to every man in her life dying horribly. It's just... It captures the trans experience pretty well, I think. Every single trans character in here is hypersexual, and they all have issues, they all have derogatory language, they all just are very annoying 
which I these are supposed to be what I would assume are sympathetic characters, but no one in the story is sympathetic at all. I'd also like to note that on the way to a safe haven early in the book, protesters throw piss at the car, like trans activists do. Glass shattered against the van's driver's side door. Fran screamed and lurched sideways into Beth let out a strangled hiss of pain. Local color, said Pitt Stains, turning the smile at them. Dark yellow liquid sheeted down the window. Besides these points, I dislike the amount of run-on sentences, the use of sexualized and degrading language, and just the hypersexualization of the entire novel. There are a total of 16 sex scenes if you include both the gang rape and explicit fantasization, one of which occurred at a funeral. Don't be a C, Fran hissed back, just do it. Lick my taint, she whispered and took the shot. Beth whispered, are you sure you're not just a jumpy bee with clinical paranoia who'll never get diagnosed because all the psychiatrists are dead or living in, like, Monaco and some really tacky American slum? In three and somehow incredibly faggy steps, Beth had never met anyone else who walked like that. Fran was at his side. Oh my god, Fran squeaked. She clapped her bloody hands over her mouth. I killed a Chad. After sex with Beth, Fran thinks to herself, the world is over, and the only way I can know myself is by hating other women. This is not the effing time to make a point about how femme you are, Beth snarled, squatting in front of the staircase with the bow standing on end between her thighs. And then, of course, just several women in the story are noted to be chasers, with trans women being forced to play the roles of men for the sexual pleasure of women. Chasers are typically male, and the attempt to bring to mind the often misquoted most trans women will die before 30 line feels inauthentic, given that men make up almost all sexual tourists and sex buyers. Women doing the same feels like a misunderstanding of female sexuality and female sex practices, and in general, it's just unrealistic. Several reviews have called this book feminist. It is lodged in feminist bookstores, tagged as such online, and noted for being like the hands made tale and its poignancy. I find it hard to believe that so many categorize this book as horror or anything but erotica. It's filled with soapboxing, and coasting on the topic with a heavy dose of shock value, there is little substance to the plot itself, which seems to want to drift past its own plot points by the use of heavy time skips, many of which were just unclear. This book is lazy. It relies on the identity of its author to achieve fame, with everyone too afraid to accurately review it, though I can't blame the author much because it works really well. If you want to read it to hear about how straw women are defeated by coincidence and stupidity, feel free. I wish I could get my time back. And yet, all it reminds me of is of Andrea Dworkin's Our Blood, where she wrote, You asked me to talk about feminism and art. Is there a feminist art, and if so, what is it? For however long writers have written, until today, there has been masculinist art, art that serves men in a world made by men. That art has degraded women. It has, almost without exception, characterized us as main beings, impoverished sensibilities, trivial people with trivial concerns. It has, almost without exception, been saturated with a misogyny so profound, a misogyny that was in fact its worldview, that almost all of us, until today, have thought, that is what the world is, that is how women are. I asked myself, what did I learn from all those books I read as I was growing up? Did I learn anything real or true about women? Did I learn anything real or true about centuries of women and what they lived? Did those books illuminate my life or life itself in any useful or profound or generous or rich or textured or real way? I did not think so. I think that that art, those books, would have robbed me of my life as the world they served robbed my mother of hers. This, dear viewers, is where we part. For a book that is presented as being written by a woman and representative of the LGBT community and of feminism, this book just is misogynistic drivel that is violent, gory, and meant to be erotic, and quite frankly, it's a waste of time. Not a good book, the plot was very sparse. I guess it could have worked as a fabulistic telling, but it just nothing of it was interesting. Some of the writing was decent. I will say that there were some things that were decent, but there was a lot of references to modern day stuff that just feels really dated in a couple years. Like when you like reading the click books from when I was in middle school. If you read them now, they're all very obviously 2008. And that's the issue with having so many pop references is that you severely date your book. On top of that, I just just I find the use of coarse language to be a little bit lazy, especially when it's a book like this. Like, you can use language in a book, and it, it could still be a decent book, which just none of these characters were likable, I didn't think any of them were really funny. There was nothing in this book that was redeeming to me. And oh, I guess I didn't even mention, there's a mention of 
J.K. Rowling having like a castle where she and her rich friends stay inside until one day there's a fire and they all burn to death, which I didn't even recognize was supposed to be J.K. Rowling until after I was reading reviews other people wrote because it just, I'm not British, one, two, I didn't even realize this was this is this is not it's it's, it's it's supposed to be the U.S. So I wasn't thinking like why would a British woman be here or like why would you mention this? How would you know this? Like it didn't even connect for me. Anyhow, yeah, I would recommend just not reading this book. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know in the comment section down below. I think I'm the first person to really do an honest review of this book, especially on YouTube because I did some research. And I didn't really find anyone who was like, yeah, this book is bad. It fails at horror, it fails at being a feminist parable, it fails at pretty much everything except being really shitty erotica that could have stayed on fanfiction.net. If that's what, 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 uh, what you like, then have fun. Otherwise, <laughs> burn it instead. Bye.